Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us for our April Be Well Lunch and Learn titled Taking Charge of Your Money with a Budget. We have Mike Fillier and Scott Bilheimer here, um, who are retirement plan advisors with Empower. Um, if you were unaware, April is actually Financial Literacy Month, so no better way to celebrate than to have them here to talk about um, taking charge of your money with a budget. Before I pass this over to them, I just want to remind you that these are recorded, so if you can't stay with us for the entire session or would like to revisit this at another time, you will be getting a copy of the recording in a follow-up email, um, and we also place these on our Be Well website, so please check out there for today and all our previous Lunch and Learn sessions um, on our Be Well website. Secondly, if you have any questions or comment from Mike and Scott um, throughout the session, feel free to use the Q&A and the chat box feature, and they will get to as many as time allows for um, at the end of the session. And so um, with that, Mike, Scott, thank you for being here, and I will pass this over to you. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Angela. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us today um, for the Lunch and Learn. Um, uh, like um, mentioned, I am Scott Bilheimer and my colleague Mike Fillier is here with me and we're going to focus on budgets today and how you can take charge of your money with the budget. Um, during today's presentation, we'll see how creating a budget and sticking to it may help you take charge of your money, your finances and ultimately your future. Uh, we'll remind you of this again at the end of how you can connect with us following the presentation, but I wanted to let everyone know on the front end that might not know, Mike and I are your dedicated on-site retirement representatives or employees of Empower, your retirement plan provider, and Penn State Health has Mike and I as a resource for you all when you have questions about your retirement and other related financial questions. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so again, um, uh, we're here today to focus on budgets, the benefits of them, how to create them, and some helpful tips like the importance of creating an emergency fund. Next slide. So what are the benefits of having a budget? We'll look at some examples of that here on the next few slides. So a budget helps you go from wondering where your money went to knowing exactly where it should go. Uh, for example, maybe you think you spend $150 a month grabbing a bite to eat or a drink with friends, but you're actually spending 300. Or maybe you think you spend $100 a week on groceries, but it's actually $200. Um, these are just a couple quick examples. And when you don't know your budget, it's easy to start spending outside of your means or even just what you would like to do. Uh, because a budget is meant to help you prioritize spending, reduce debt, and be better prepared for unexpected expenses. And by doing that, you can better reach your short-term and long-term savings goals that once may have felt out of reach. Uh, so something we would like folks to take out of this is start putting together a budget so you can become more aware of your spending habits and actually see how much money goes to what expenses. Uh, this process gives your finances a sense of predictability that helps you get the most out of your money uh, that you bring in each month. We'll go to the next slide, Mike. So further, a budget helps you find a balance between needs, wants, and savings. Uh, there's a simple rule we can use that helps simplify budgeting. That's the 50-30-20 rule. Maybe you've heard of it before or it sounds familiar from a long time ago. Um, what the 50-30-20 rule does is it breaks your expenses um, out. So there's certain things everyone needs, um, right? There's things like housing, food, transportation, utilities, um, maybe there's other, you know, some other things you think you need, like that morning cup of coffee. Um, whatever those needs are, a good rule of thumb is to have your needs make up 50% of your budget. The next 30% is your discretionary spending that goes towards things such as entertainment, things like going to a concert or a movie or, or other hobbies, and uh, that fun stuff we all need to keep ourselves and our lives balanced. Finally, 20% should be put into savings, like paying down debt, retirement savings, and uh, building up your emergency fund. Let me go to the next slide. So what sometimes makes things feel difficult is that it feels like so many things are competing for our money. Uh, your house, your car, groceries, your cell phone bill, gas, tuition, student loans, internet, insurance, clothing, hobbies, vacations, that list could go on forever. Um, but now that we know the purpose of the budget and the benefits, we can get down to the creation of the budget, which starts with figuring out to which of these things your money is going to. Go to the next slide, Mike. 
So here we make it really simple. Um, a budget has, at its core has three components, your income, your expenses, and your goals. The idea becomes that when you know what you make and spend each month, you can identify areas you can adjust to reach your financial goals. Go to the next slide. Okay, so let's look more at that first part, your income. How much money do we have coming in in a typical month? Um, obviously, this includes your paycheck, but don't forget other supplemental income you may have each month. Um, these mo uh, numbers can change each month. Uh, maybe you always work overtime or there was a bonus one month. Try to keep an eye on these numbers and update your budget for a couple months to get an accurate estimate. Um, I'll speak from my perspective. What my wife and I do is look at our income over a year, divide that by 12, and that will give you your average income for a month. Um, one of the reasons it can vary each month beyond supplemental income outside of your job is that even if your only income is from your, your job with Penn State Health, when you get paid biweekly, you have 26 pays in a year. So there's two months where you get three pays instead of two. Uh, that's why it might be helpful to look at the average over the year. But if you want to play it more conservative, you could do your budget just based on two pays and can think of those months where you get a third paycheck as a nice bonus. Go to the next slide. Okay, so now let's look at our expenses. Um, as you can imagine, this can be a little bit more complicated than tracking income. Uh, so like we've said before, keep an eye on this and, and update this over several months. Uh, some expenses will be identical each month, um, things like rent, car payments, insurance payments, other expenses we know we'll have, but we don't know the exact amount. Those are the things like gas, groceries, uh, utilities. Um, the third category that we haven't really touched on much yet are those surprise or unexpected expenses. Those are things like car repairs, doctor's visits, or emergencies. Um, we don't always know when exactly these will happen or how much they'll cost, but if we can plan for them in some way, we'll be better off for it. Um, this will tie into building an emergency savings fund, which Mike will get into um, in a little bit. Um, but lastly here, quality of life expenses uh, th that you might be able to budget more closely and control things like um, how often you go out to eat, clothes shopping or buying gifts. Um, so we all deserve to buy ourselves things on occasion and give some self-care to our ourselves. So if we know we're going to do this to an extent, let's build it into the budget. Um, also, if we lay out the budget like this, we can identify areas we can cut back uh, when needed. Next slide. Okay, so once we've gone through this process and you have a good sense of what your income and expenses are, um, you can create a budget. Simply subtract your uh, expenses from your income, and if the number you get is positive, then your uh, budget can help you figure out where to put your extra money. Maybe you can put more into your 401k. Maybe you can make more payments uh, towards outstanding debt or start saving for an upcoming expense you're planning for like buying a car or the down payment on a new house. Um, if the number's negative, then your budget is helping you too and you can identify areas you can cut expenses uh, so you don't keep adding to bad debt, like credit cards, for example. Um, maybe you cut some of your quality of life expenses like spending less money shopping or going out to eat and you, you make food at home. Um, maybe you can cut a uh, recurring subscription. Um, we all subscribe to things over the years. Um, but are, are they all worth it? Are we even using all of them? A couple months ago, I realized I was spending like $5 a month on some Amazon music subscription where months had gone by and I, I hadn't utilized the service. So finally canceled. Um, so $5 might not sound like a lot, but when you identify a few things here and there, it can quickly add up, especially when you extend that out over time. Uh, in any event, whether you're positive or negative, your budget gives you a real understanding of your financial situation. Just remember your financial needs and circumstances change over time. So try to revisit your budget periodically. Next slide. Here's just a, a quick sample budget. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this because this is going to look different for everyone, but you can start to see things like your income versus your fixed expenses, variable expenses like groceries and um, you know things like emergencies, like a doctor's visits. Um, and things that are just nice to have, where the example they gave here is buying a, a video game. Um, so in this quick little example, you, you see there's a surplus. So this person could do things like add to their savings or pay off debt. Um, alternatively, say their income was a couple hundred dollars less, maybe they make the decision not to buy that video game. 
we can go to the next slide. So everyone's uh, situation is going to be different and it's going to take time to get a handle on budgeting. It, it might feel daunting at first, maybe even unrealistic, but don't get discouraged if it doesn't fall into place immediately. Um, everyone's got to start somewhere and there's a lot of tools out there. Uh, you can keep your budget on your phone and refer to it in your da uh, daily life. I'm not saying look at it every day, but, but extra awareness of it will uh, help you out over time. Um, maybe that awareness helps you and you, you take a day or two to think about a big and non-essential purchase. If it still feels like a, a good idea over the next couple of days, then okay, maybe go ahead and, and do it. But maybe that time you gave yourself will stop you from some of those impulse buys. Um, to that end, another tip when you go, uh, you know, just a quick tip here. If you go shopping, create a list before you go to the store. Uh, and if it's the grocery store, you know, try not to go when you're hungry. This will help you avoid unplanned purchases. Um, there's all different types of tips out there, uh, but hopefully this can get you started and get your mind going. And, and I'm going to pass it to, to Mike, who's going to uh, continue to take a, a deeper dive into, into these topics. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. So let's um, kind of give some real world examples on what uh, we can do. So the first thing is, you know, if you do have found money in your budget, um, what do you do with it? So first thing off, always look at increasing retirement savings. One of the things that we always say when you're meeting with Scott or I is if we can get a 25 year old to a 35 year old to do basically 10% on your voluntary or uh, with that mandatory five savings plus Penn State's 5% that they're giving you, that 15% for 25 to 30 years puts most people in a very good place to retire by the time they're in their mid to late 60s. If you want to retire sooner than that, you're going to have to save more. So that's where that surplus can go. Setting up that emergency fund. One of the things I always point out when I'm helping somebody const uh, construct or craft a budget is car uh, repairs and car expenses. We know the tires and brakes are not going to last forever on our cars. So knowing that, let's set aside some money so that that is not a surprise when we take it to the mechanic or the car inspection every year and suddenly they say you need brakes or you need your tires replaced. One easy practical way to potentially set money aside if the budget is tight is to give up one night out a month with friends instead of going to that entertainment venue or the bar or whatever that might be have a let's all come to my place uh, gathering. And I actually started doing this years ago with uh, my closest group of friends. We all get together at one of our places and we actually do it every other week. So we're doing it twice a week, but it's a bring your own food or bring your own beer uh, organization. And what we do is we play board games, we watch a movie, um, we talk about whatever we wanna talk about. But most of the time we are just there to have a good time and not spend money. And I let all my friends know, hey, the reason we're doing this is number one, I wanna see you. And number two, I gotta save the money. So that created about, depending on the size of your family or where you go usually for entertainment, potentially $60 every time we do it. Well, if you take $60 times 12, right? That is $720. So in one year, you could save up $720. Now, if you're doing that twice a month, like my friends and I are doing, that's almost $1,500 in one year that you can set aside. That pays for the average tires or, and brakes on most cars. That also pays for lots of other things. So that's a very practical way to get that emergency fund set up. Obviously paying debt down more quickly and then saving for your children's college or your continuing education or even a vacation, that's the way to do it. Now, if you have a deficit, don't panic. One of the things I always tell folks when you're building that budget and realize that things are tight or you probably may know that things are tight and you're feeling that potential frustration with not having enough money or feeling like you're living paycheck to paycheck. Well, figure out what you can eliminate like that one time out a month instead of going to that entertainment venue or the bar to have everybody come over to one of your friend's houses or your house and stay in for that night and save that money. 
Another one that I always like to use uh, is we all have what I call the comfort spends, right? So for someone I just met and actually uh, created a budget for a couple of weeks ago, it was shoes. For them, they like buying shoes and they've got a lot of shoes. Well, one of the interesting things is I never tell people stop doing that because we are creatures of habit. We like our comfort spending. For some people, it might be um, Turkey Hill iced tea. One of my best friends for many, many years, that was his spend. Every single day he was buying Turkey Hill iced tea. Uh, for, one, for someone else, it might be Starbucks lattes. It might be Dunkin' Donuts. It might be McDonald's. We all have things that we spend money on. So if you have a problem with the budget, look at just eliminating a little bit of that comfort spend. So in the case of my friend who I've known for almost 35 years, uh, he was spending on average $7 every single day at Turkey Hill. And, you know, when I asked him about it, when we were creating the budget, that was more than $300 a month that he was giving to Turkey Hill. And I said, is that all iced tea? And he said, no, no, I'll buy something else when I'm in there. Sometimes I'll go there for lunch or whatever. But that was his comfort uh, stop on his way to or from work. Uh, and so that was where a lot of his extra money that he really didn't know, couldn't afford was going. So instead of telling him to stop, because I knew he wouldn't be able to, and same with all of us, I said, what I want you to do is open up a new savings account at the bank or credit union. And on a couple of days a week, I want you to not spend the money at Turkey Hill. I want you to skip it. Either bring something from home or drive a different way to avoid spending that roughly $7 every single day. So we decided uh, with his uh, blessing that he was going to give up three times out of a week. So three times out of a week, right? 20-ish dollars a week that he's now saving. That's over a thousand dollars in a year that he now has in his budget. I can tell you, this was many, many years ago when I did this for my friend, that it took him about two months to completely break his Turkey Hill iced tea uh, addiction. And he took all of that money, again, it was roughly $300 a month and applied that to his student loans. It took him four years to pay off almost $40,000 in student loans, but he did it. And then he began saving uh, and actually just last uh, uh, 20, end of 2022, uh, he bought he bought his first house uh, by continuing to save that money, having given up his Turkey Hill uh, ad addiction. So that's just one practical example on how it can work. And that's really where it comes down to adjusting that non-essential spending. Uh, and obviously, getting rid of debt is always going to help you. Now, this example here is another way to try to save money. And it's a little fun. It's, but it's also a little gimmicky, and most people are not going to be able to do this. And that is, every single week, you double the amount that you save. So what, week one, you save a dollar. Week two, you save two dollars. Week three, you save three, and so on. In one year, you've saved $1,378. All I'll say is, when it comes to that comfort food that you're giving up, whether it's a latte or maybe an eating out lunch, immediately open up your phone app and transfer that money into that new savings account give yourself the reward of paying yourself when you are not spending the money. Don't just leave it in the checking account because we'll end up spending it on something else. So that was the key with my friend. Once he started to open up that phone app and transfer that $7 every time he skipped going to Turkey Hill, he started to see that grow in his savings. And after a couple of months, that motivated him to dramatically change his spending habits. So again, this is not something that happens overnight. It's not something that is immediate. We can search into the budget to really look for ways to get that savings going. And of course, setting goals and then working towards those goals is critically important to your budget and your future. If you do want to retire early, you're going to have to save more money. There isn't any other way to do it. And you better start sooner rather than later. So with those long-term goals, if that's one of your goals is to retire as soon as possible, maybe as soon as you hit age 59 and a half, 
start saving more now and you're going to need a budget to help you do that. Maybe you want a second home, uh, a home at the shore or a home down in Florida. That second vacation home isn't going to magically happen unless you begin to save money for that long-term goal. And obviously those short-term goals, always about paying down debt, potentially saving for a new car or that emergency fund. I always like to add into those short-term goals, car maintenance. We know we're gonna spend money on the car. So set that money aside now. If you own a home, have a home maintenance short-term goal budget. You know that the hot water heater is not gonna last forever. The refrigerator won't last forever. Maybe you want to redo the bathroom or redo the kitchen. Those can be very expensive projects. So the more you can put into that, the better off your budget and your future is going to be. So whatever those short or long-term goals are, build them into the budgets. And one more piece that I always throw in, short-term goals should also include your gift giving, whether that is charitable giving or uh, uh, assisting um, someone in the family, set that goal in your budget. My wife and I, for many, many years with our kids, set the goal at the beginning of each year. Did we get a raise? How much are we going to spend on them? What are birthdays and Christmas going to look like? And then we set that money aside in the budget so that we had a separate account that Christmas money and gift money went into so that we did not blow up the budget by overspending in that gift category or that charitable giving category. So we know that life is going to throw unexpected things at us. That's what that emergency fund is for. The example I like to use is if you don't have an emergency fund, what is going to happen if that car suddenly throw, blows a gasket and you need to get it repaired? Suddenly that phone has been broken or something happens to one of your pets and that's an expensive vet bill that you must suddenly have. <clears throat> well, for most of us, if we don't have the emergency fund, it's going to go on a credit card. Let's just say it's an average repair bill on that car or maybe replacing a refrigerator of $1,200. And you put it on a credit card at 18%. You're adding cost if you don't pay that credit card off right away. Most of us carry that balance. Well, over five years, that's going to be an extra $628. I also like to pick on Kohl's credit card. I like Kohl's as a store, but their credit card is the highest interest rate of, uh, available by law, 29% here in Pennsylvania. So if you put $1,000 on a Kohl's car and just carry it for one year, they're charging you $290 on whatever you put on that, if it's $1,000. So although that might sound like, oh, it's really easy, I'm going to use my Kohl's cars and get those Kohl's bucks and get that discount. If you don't pay that off, you are adding 29% interest to that. And on $1,000 in one year, that's $290. That's good for them, bad for you. This is where the emergency fund has to come in to break that cycle of putting those emergencies on a credit card. Now, if you have that money, you, don't, you can still use the credit card to get those rewards, but now pay it off with your emergency fund and then start building that emergency fund back up. That's really what it is. Now, most financial experts and professionals say we should have somewhere between three and six months of our monthly budget expenses set aside for that big emergency like being laid off or having some sort of medical emergency where we can't work for a month or two and now you're covered. That might be unrealistic for many of us. So again, start small. Even if you just give up two lattes at Starbucks a month, that's $16 times 52 weeks. That's $832 in one year, just for giving up a couple of those expensive uh, Starbucks lattes. So it can be done. We can get you there. And that's what Scott and I can help you with. Um, I tell folks that I meet with and help with budgeting. I can be the bully or your cheerleader, whichever works best for your personality. Um, as a bully, I say, what'd you spend your money on? What are you doing? Let's look, let's review. And as the cheerleader, if you've done something great, I want to uh, have you reward yourself for that, uh, what you've done. And I want you to get better. One of the most successful budgets that I uh, had was a few years ago with a, a nurse. 
Uh, she was still living with her mom. She had a child very early in life. And so she knew she had a hard road ahead of her. She had student loans that she needed to pay off. She was approaching age 30 and had never taken a vacation because she couldn't afford it. So we set up a budget for her. We started a plan to get her student loans paid down. But at the same time, we wanted a goal that she really, really wanted to take that vacation. And so after some work, it took about three and a half months before she felt comfortable with her budget. And within 18 months, she had saved almost $3,000 and she took her mom and her child on a Disney cruise. That was the first vacation she ever took. And I can tell you one of the best things in my career and my job was when she brought in that little book of pictures from that vacation. So it does work. We can help you come and see us. We also have online tools for you. If you go right to retire.pennstatehealth.org, sign into your account, look for My Financial Path under Planning. There will be a tab right up at the top. It's going to give you all sorts of interactive ways to help you with budgeting, no matter what those goals might be. And then, of course, we do want you to go online and look at your retirement savings. We've got an app. Uh, no matter what uh, you're using, whether it's an Apple or uh, the Google store, we're there. And then, of course, go online again at retire.pennstatehealth.org. All of that information is there for you. We've got our toll-free number there. If you want customer service, they can help you make changes to your account or get online if you've never done that or you're locked out for some reason. Schedule a time with Scott or I to help. We've got a direct number there that goes to a voicemail at Penn State. And then we have that Penn State specific uh, email that you can go. If you want to set up an appointment with Scott or I, you can use pennstatehealth.empowermytime.com. Or if you go directly to retire.pennstatehealth.org, there's going to be a window right there at the front that says schedule your time. And just click on that and you'll immediately be able to set up an appointment with Scott or I. Now, we've just got a couple of disclosure slides here, and then that's really the presentation, and we can open it up for questions uh, for everyone. So I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on these disclosure slides. Uh, they basically just go into the role that Scott and I uh, serve for you as retirement plan advisors, uh, and of course, that's the investments that you're using in the plan and how those really function and work. So with that, let's go ahead and open it up to questions. And we'll do our best to uh, answer whatever those questions might be uh, that, uh, that we've collected. All right. So Mike, see I, I see the questions here. I can, I can start. So there's a couple. There's one Perfect. from earlier that mentioned, it says, could you tell us what the suggested amount was, again, to boost our 401k to prepare for retirement? Um, yeah. So that can be different for everybody. Um, I think what Mike was referencing is if you're uh, earlier in your career, we'll often give people a, a guideline if you can do about 15% total. So most Penn State Health employees are already at 10% with the automatic five and then Penn State Health matching 5%. If you can work towards another five and voluntary and get to 15%, if you did 15% over most of your career, that would put you on a good track to replace um, your income in retirement. Um, that number, though, can be, again, different for each person in their specific situation. If it's something that you want to look more into for your um, specific situation, please reach out to Mike and I and we can uh, take a look at that. Um, second question here is, do you find there is an advantage to putting more toward debt or versus savings or vice versa? Um, that uh, can depend. There are things like good debt and bad debt, right? Good debt might be, hey, you've got a mortgage that you locked into a couple years ago at, you know, 3%. That's, that's good debt, right? Um, whereas you, if you have credit card debt, you know, if you have credit card debt at 18, 20%, you, get, you know, you heard the one that Mike gave, those, uh, you're going to want to pay down those more, right? So what I typically will tell people, and, and Mike can add to this if, um, um, if he has anything here, but I'll say, think about what your uh, potential savings rate could be, right? If on average, maybe let's say conservatively you could get seven, 8% a year in your retirement um, account. 
and you were debating, do I put more towards my retirement account or let's use an example of school loans, right? And your school loans are 5%. Well, your money might do more for you in your retirement account if it's, if it's earning more than that 5%. Um, alternatively, if it's a higher interest rate, then you're going to want to pay that down. So essentially, you want to tack debt that has high interest rates first. If you have alternatives where you, your money could be making more in interest than the interest on the debt, um, then you might be better off saving. So um, hopefully that's helpful, but that you know can change depending on the situation you're, you're looking at. Um, let's see here. More questions coming in. Um, what if you uh, are very- I can take that next ahead, one if Mike. you want, yeah. Um, if you're close to retirement, suggestions on keeping or increasing what you have for retirement, so the closer we get, sometimes it's better to use any extra you have in the budget to pay down debt, specifically like your mortgage if you still own your, your home and have a mortgage, uh, or building up that emergency fund. As we're getting closer to retirement, the time isn't there to get the earnings or the growth out of what you're saving. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do that. Maybe you do both. But the best suggestion I can give you is to set up an appointment with Scott or I so that we can review your specific circumstances on what might work best for your uh, situation. For some people, piling in as much as they can years before, you know, a few years before they retire is a really good strategy. For others, perhaps it's paying down debt or getting um, those home repairs done as you get close to retirement. So it's hard to give a specific answer. Best thing to do is set up that appointment with Scott or I so that we can really help you uh, with that. Yeah, there shouldn't, oh, the, yeah, the QR code. Yeah, let me go backwards and I can put up that QR code for the uh, app. Mike, as um, you're getting to that, I'll go to the next question. So what's the maximum voluntary 401k contribution amount or percent? Um, so the voluntary contribution that you can do, it, it depends on age. So if you're under 50, you can do up to 23,000 in voluntary contributions. If you're over, if you're in the year that you turn 50 or, or above, you can do up to 30,500 in voluntary contributions. Um, the most you can do from a uh, percentage standpoint is 75%. So if you're doing a, if you're putting in a percentage, you, the, the most you're able to do is 75% of pay. That's actually a recent change, um, but 75% is the max there. Yeah. And just a note to um, while we're on that topic, the 23,000 and 30,500 respectively, that's again, voluntary contributions, your automatic 5% that occurs does not count towards that uh, limit. So that's just your voluntary contributions. Yep. Yeah, and the envelope method uh, certainly works for a lot of people. Um, what that is, is a budgeting method where you set aside different categories and then you kind of put the cash in those envelopes for each category in your budget. So an entertainment button, you know, an eating out button, uh, envelope, um, you know, a, a food envelope, gas, all those sort of things. And then when the money's gone, the money's gone. That does work for some people. Um, for There's lots of other uh, ways that you can budget. Um, I also saw someone ask kind of where where to go for a budgeting type of um, app or, or uh, uh, what system to use. We've got a free one for you online. If you go online and look at the top, there's going to be a planning tab. And one of them um, uh, is a debt solution that you can plug in your budget and build out your budget in, uh, through our financial uh, tools. All of ours are free. There's uh, no um, cost whatsoever on our website for any of our tools. So feel free to use. And I always tell people, you can use a spreadsheet, you can use the envelope method. There's so many different ways that you can do it that shouldn't cost you anything nowadays. Um, so yeah, feel free to look into those. All right, next question here is, is it best to change investment accounts to low risk investments as one nears retirement? Um, again, that could depend on each person's situation, but generally the answer to that would be yes. Um, now you have a default investment as a Penn State health employee where you get placed into what's uh, called your respective target date fund. 
Um, if you haven't heard of the terminology target date fund before, you can also think of that as like an age-based fund. So you defaultly get placed into what's considered an age appropriate investment. So what that means is earlier in your career, you're going to be invested more aggressively because you've got a longer investment horizon. Um, as you get closer to retirement, you're, uh, you've gone, you know, from more of that growth phase into, um, you know, you want to keep and get more conservative what you have, right? So you go, uh, you will become more conservative as you get closer to retirement. That happens automatically for you if you're in those target dated funds. If you're picking and choosing your own investments, that is probably something you would want to revisit on occasion um, because if you're picking and choosing your own investments, um, those do not just automatically adjust like the target dated fund. So if you're doing that, it can be good to set up a meeting with Mike or I to review that and see if it might be appropriate for you. Um, there's other uh, investment options out there as well. There is a managed account service um, that you can enroll in that um, looks at more things beyond just the age uh, appropriate funds or the target dated funds. Um, the managed account service does come with an added fee. If that's something you're considering, um, I would tell you to set up a meeting with Mike or I, um, but that service does look at more variables other than just age. So it'll look at, at different things like what you're contributing, what your balance is. Um, but I would tell most people their target dated fund is, is largely appropriate for most people. But if that's um, something you want to look into, feel free to set up some time with Mike or I. Absolutely. And the, the next uh, two questions are short and sweet. One is, how do you change your contributions? And the other is, is there a Roth option? So the answer is yes to the Roth option, both in the 401k plan or the 403b plan. If you're doing voluntary contributions, you can select either before tax or Roth. And to change those contributions, when you sign in on the left-hand side, you're going to see a gray bar, or sometimes it'll all actually show you the 401k and the 403b or we call it the tax sheltered annuity plan. You simply click on whichever one you wanna do the contribution in. Uh, and then you're gonna see on the account overview page, my contributions are 2024 contributions. And right next to it, there's gonna be a view details button that'll walk you through changing those contributions. And it looks almost exactly the same on the app for doing that. Um, one thing I will say for those who might say, okay, Roth, that's great. What is that, Mike? So before tax contributions gives you a tax break today. So it doesn't come out of your paycheck dollar for dollar and it reduces your adjusted gross income. So you pay less taxes now. When you take the money out sometime in the future, hopefully in retirement, that's when you're gonna pay your income tax. For most of us, we'll be in a lower tax bracket when we retire. Roth contributions, you're paying all your taxes today never pay taxes again on those contributions or the growth of those contributions as long as they've been in the Roth plan for five years and you've hit the age of 59 and a half. So that means you're going to have a bucket of tax-free money in that Roth bucket. Um, whether or not that's right for you depends on many circumstances. I always tell folks, have that appointment with Scott or I so that we can walk you through sort of the implications of both. Uh, generally speaking, the younger you are, the more sense it uh, makes to do those Roth contributions if you can afford to do so. All right. Um, question here. Uh, I rolled over my 401k three years ago. I believe after three years we are invested 100%. Does that include what I rolled over also? So important thing with vesting. Vesting only really applies to what Penn State Health's employer contributions are. Anything that you contribute yourself, including your automatic 5%, anything you voluntarily do, anything you roll over, that is always 100% vested regardless how long you've been with Penn State Health. So the vesting and the three-year um, rule that you are um, alluding to has to do with Penn State Health's employer contributions. And as long as you have worked for Penn State Health for over three years, where you have worked over a thousand hours in three different calendar years, then the Penn State Health employer contributions also become 100% vested. Um, Penn State Health's vesting is all or nothing. So if you were to leave Penn State Health after a year or two years, um, none of their employer contributions would go with. Someone else uh, had a question saying, my husband retire, uh, is retiring next month. Congratulations. Um, 10 years between us in age, 
do you feel it's still appropriate to put money in our savings? So depends on the budget, right? The, the, the only way to answer that, uh, that question um, correctly is to know what your budget is. I would always suggest that something is going into savings for those emergencies. Even when we retire, things are still going to break down on our cars and in the house. Uh, and so having money set aside for those type of things. And I've also had retirees tell me they're going to spend a lot of money on their grandchildren. Uh, so savings in retirement? Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't necessarily go away once we retire. Uh, but to, to get more specific, make that appointment with Scott or I so that we can look at your specific circumstances and try to craft something that's best for you. All right, uh, I'll do next couple here quickly. Does Penn State Health match more than 5% in, uh, of employee contributions? Um, the way I'm going to answer that is that regardless of whatever you voluntarily do, it does not change what Penn State Health's employer contributions are. So if you go in and do you know, another 5% voluntary contribution, Penn State Health's um, 5% contribution stays the same. So just know that you are getting the max from Penn State Health uh, regardless of anything that you voluntarily do with your account. Um, what is the tax shelter? You, I believe you're probably referring to the other account that most people see when they log in, the Penn State Health Tax Sheltered Annuity Program. That is a 403B plan. So some people do not have the 401k. Others do have the 401k and still have to utilize the tax shelter plan. Um, it would have to do with um, what type of employee you are. If you have questions on that, reach out to Mike or I. Um, if, you, um, if you are a resident, for example, residents don't have the 401k. They have to use the 403B. PRN employees do not have the 401k. They have to use the 403B. There's a couple other examples, too, where you might have to use the 403B instead of the, the 401K. Um, but just know that not everybody has to utilize the 403B, right. although there are some people that, that do. Um, but for the majority of folks, they can do everything in the 401K plan. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm not sure someone uh, is mentioning rolled over from a previous employer that might be referring to are you vested in those Rollovers are always your dollars. So they were contributions from a prior plan. They're yours. It's, it's always yours. Um, they, that money always belongs to you. So hopefully that answers that. And then I'll take this next one. When setting up the 50-20-30 rule, um, some of the savings comes out of gross, uh, not net. How should you adjust your savings from the net to get the correct percentage? So, so no, no. Uh, the 50-30-20 rule should be on net. Um, and that's where we run into lots of challenges depending on circumstances. Depending on your rent or mortgage, that might be taking up a significant chunk of your budget. Uh, and that's where many people, depending on that uh, housing cost, their budget's out of whack to begin with. And so that 50, 30, 20 should be on your net. We, we, when we talk budgeting, we're never talking gross amounts. So um, again, Best thing to do is look at your specific circumstances. Let Scott and I help you walk through that uh, and figure out what needs to be adjusted. It doesn't work for everybody. So even though they say it's the 50, 30, 20 rule, I let's tell people it should be more of a guideline depending on your specific circumstances. Hopefully that helps clarify that a little bit. Uh, Roth is also count as retirement. Um, if that's referring to our Roth contributions part of your retirement account, they are. Um, so if you do yeah. do Roth contributions, I let people know you're not opening up a second account that is Roth. It's you're, you're still in one account under the 401k. You will just have it broken up by, it's referred to as money source of which portion of your balance is before tax funds and which portion of your balance is Roth. So that way, when it does come to withdrawing the um, funds, they know how the tax treatment is at that time. Um, the question about how do you update the amounts in other accounts that are manually linked to your 401k account, I think Mike answered that in the other um, chat there, um, but you can just manually update those when you're when you're logged in. There should be an area that you can, can do that under. Um, you can also link accounts um, instead of manually doing it, and then that will update it in real time instead. Yeah, and then uh, again, another question about the Roth. Um, so 
um, just to be clear, inside an employer-sponsored plan like you have at Penn State Health, if you can do a Roth, it doesn't create a completely separate account. It's all, all the money is in the same account. You're just going to have two buckets. One is before tax dollars and one is Roth dollars. You can still go to the bank and do an IRA, but I always tell people, maximize the employer-sponsored plan you have with Penn State first. You can do $23,000 into it versus $6,500 in that IRA. So put all that money in the Penn State plan first before you do an IRA, because number one, it's almost three times as much. Number two, 100% of your dollar co dollars go into the investment, whereas that is not necessarily the case depending on the IRA you're doing because there's an investment cost for doing that. Inside your employer-sponsored plan with Penn State, all of your money is efficiently being invested every time you make a contribution, whether it's before tax or wrong. And so that's one of the huge advantages we have. And then of course, if you've hit the wonderful age of 50 or older, you get a catch-up contribution. And this year you can put in $30,500 into that, uh, into the employer-sponsored plan. So there is no comparison between that and opening up a separate IRA at the bank. All right. Uh, was this session recorded? Um, I, I, it was recorded, um, and I believe that will be available to you all um, after the meeting. Um, yeah, I have a 401k, but my husband has a pension plan, which is better. Um, there's no exact answer to that question. It can depend. Um, all uh, pensions can be different. Um, you know, I, if you were somebody that worked in the, um, you know, so school system and have a pension, you know, from 40 years ago or, you know, in the government and, you know, worked for the government for 30 years, those could be very good pensions. There's other pensions that, you know, might not be as great. Um, it, it really just depends. Oftentimes with those pensions, they they may try to give you options for getting out of it. Uh, that's something where Mike and I will look at those and say, hey, is it better to stay in the pension? Is it better to roll it over to my 401k? We can kind of look at those things and give you some some guidance of what the different options are and what might work best for you. Um, does it cost extra to have you work with us to set up a budget? Uh, meeting with Mike and I does not cost anything. We are a free resource for you all. Um, the only time that there I can think of where you would have a cost is if you enroll in managed accounts there's a there's a cost for that service but just setting up meetings with with Mike or I um, you can do that as often as you want throughout the year um, and there is no no cost for meeting with us and using us as a resource yeah and just to add on to that we are that free resource we do everything uh, that a financial advisor can do um, we have our investment licenses uh, including life insurance so we can walk you through all of those things, but we do not sell any product. So our role, we're, we're part of making sure that you get information and educate you on getting the best possible outcome for your finances, all the way from basic budgeting out to retirement planning. So yeah, take advantage of that. Uh, we are that free resource. Couple more here. I, I have an actual retirement account from a pre previous employer. Is it best to transfer that money into an account that is actively earning? Well, if the retirement account that you current that you have from you know previous employer is not earning, um, then I, yes, so tell you to do something with that as soon as possible. Uh, most of the times, if you have an account from a previous employer, the only thing that typically changes is that you don't have any new contributions going into it. It should still hopefully be invested for you and uh, fluctuating and earning based on the market. Um, but it still may be beneficial, even if that is the case, to roll it over. Um, uh, most people often consolidate. There can be reasons to not consolidate. Maybe they really like the options with the previous employer's account. Um, but in general, um, we can look at what those options are and, and help you if you do want to uh, roll over those funds to Penn State Health's account and, um, and consolidate. One of the biggest things about going through your career and getting closer to retirement is simplifying your life. Uh, you go through your career. If, you, if you're at all these different spots and you have retirement accounts, you can easily lose track of it. It is not fun to try to track them down and talk to different HR departments and different retirement providers. So I would tell you, if you do have um, funds um, 
make sure you are keeping track of them. And yes, it does often make sense to consolidate and roll it over to your current employer's account. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the last question we currently have is, will we look at spouse accounts if they are not Penn State employees? Yeah, we're spouse friendly. Um, I just had a meeting uh, uh, two days ago um, with uh, someone who does work at Penn State and their spouse attended and they don't work at Penn State. And we did a really good overview and kind of walked through their retirement picture. So we're, our job is to make sure you are prepared and comfortable and confident that you're doing the right things to be able to retire. So yeah, absolutely, spouses are welcome. See another one in here, if consolidating retirement accounts to Penn State Health, what would, in, would that increase the earnings on the account as a whole? Um, again, that's not a straightforward answer. You could have different investments in a different account, uh, earning a different rate than what your investments in Penn State Health are earning. I can let you know that in general, like most employers have similar funds for the most part. Um, so if you do consolidate, there can be um, advantages uh, like compounding can help account when you combine accounts, um, you can benefit from compounding. Um, but I, I can't give an exact answer on whether, you know, an account somewhere else is earning um, more or less than your account with Penn State Health. Does the 23500 you can add include the 5% from Penn State Health, or is that just individual? So um, just to go over this information again, the, what you do voluntarily, so you can do up to um, 23000 voluntarily above the automatic 5% that's going into your account. That's also 23000 voluntarily above what Penn State Health is contributing to your account. So think of it as... The, the contributions that automatically go into your account, the 5% uh, from your own pay, the 5% from Penn State Health, um, that does not go towards those limits we've discussed through the, the meeting, like the 23,000 or the 30,500. Those you can do, that's all your voluntary contributions. So no, those do not count towards those limits. I think there was one, was there a last question in there, Mike? Did I see something about whether there's yeah, virtual? Yeah, I was just going to address it here. I, I did answer it, but yeah, um, Scott and I are available virtually. Um, we, we use WebEx to meet with people or phone calls. We also do in person. We have an office at Crystal A um, that Scott is usually uh, manning. And then we're also in person at many of the locations. Um, I handle um, Lancaster Medical Center in St. Joe's. Um, Scott and I both handle uh, Hershey Med uh, directly, and then Scott typically will also handle Holy Spirit and Hamden. Um, and so look forward to, uh, you might see some emails or some communication when we are on site at those particular locations. It's a couple of times a month uh, uh, usually, but the bulk of our meetings are going to be virtual because that allows us to see more people uh, at your convenience. Uh, and we have early morning uh, all the way to, you know, early evening. So, yeah, just reach out to us uh, either online or using the scheduling tool. You'll see what's available out there. Yeah, so, and if you don't see a time that's available to you, please reach out to Mike or I. We can, you know, we can make exceptions to schedules. We know that everybody's got, you know, a little bit different uh, requirements with where they have to be and different things. So if you do need something outside of what you see that's available there, please send us an, an email or give us a call and we'll work with you to, to get something scheduled that works for everybody. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mike and Scott. A lot of great information and thank you so much for taking the time to answer everyone's questions. I hope that people do take advantage of your services and I hope that you get a lot of emails and um, appointments here um, to help work with some of our, our folks. And so um, thank you again to everyone. This was recorded, so that will be going out in an email as well as um, placed on our Be Well website as well. Um, so again, thank you, Mike and Scott. Thank you, everyone. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.